Hi everybody, this is Erin from the DNA Learning Center. I hope everybody's having a wonderful day. I'm here to teach you a genetic engineering experiment, so welcome. Uh, what we'll be doing is we'll be working with living bacteria cells and we'll be introducing foreign or new DNA into these cells. The goal of the experiment is to see if we give these cells new DNA, will they have a new trait? So let's get started. I said we were going to do a type of genetic engineering. Does anybody know what genetic engineering means? In general, we think about genetic engineering as any sort of manipulation or change of DNA. This can involve us cutting DNA in specific regions. It can involve gluing fragments of DNA together. It can also involve transferring DNA into cells, which again is what I'll be doing with you. So let's go to the board for a second. I'd like to show you a little bit about DNA and bacteria cells. So on our board here, I have an image of a fragment or a piece of DNA. Does anybody know what the letters DNA stand for? Let me take out my pen. DNA stands for deoxy, Ribo, nucleic acid. And DNA is a molecule or a chemical that we find in cells. DNA carries information in it. Does anybody know what the information in the DNA is for? I think I'm going to draw my own strand of DNA on the board, so let me get a new page. My image may not be as nice as the one I had before, but you'll get the general idea. As I'm drawing this shape of DNA, does anyone know what the name of this shape is? Let me show you my model as well. So right here, I have a beautiful model of DNA. It has so many different colors. What's the name of this shape? Oh, I see some people answering. Excellent, thank you so much. This right here is a double helix. And if I untwist it, when it's twisted like this, it looks, well, in my opinion, kind of like a twisted ladder or a twisted staircase. And if we untwist it, we can see that it looks like a regular ladder or even some of my students think it looks like railroad tracks. We have not always known what the shape of DNA has been. There were scientists working for many years to figure out what the shape of this molecule is. And in 1953, Dr. Watson and Dr. Crick revealed to the world that DNA was in a double helix shape. This is considered by many scientists to be one of the most important discoveries in the history of biology. Now, why do you think it's important to understand the shape of a DNA molecule? Well, when we're trying to study something, it's so important for us to try to envision what that is in our minds if we can't actually see it. And I work with DNA in the lab every day, but most times I'm looking at liquid that just looks like water. I can't see the DNA itself because it's just too small. It's important for scientists like me to be able to think about DNA and what it looks like so that I can consider how cells use or access the information in DNA. Let's go back to the board for a minute because I want to talk about that information. So here's my double helix on the board. I'm going to highlight a specific region of the DNA right here. This area that I've highlighted, I'm going to refer to as a gene. Has everybody heard of a gene before? Genes are basically sections of DNA that carry information, and that information can be used to make mRNA or proteins. Proteins are incredible molecules. Let me shrink up my information here for a second, just so we have more room to write. There we go. So proteins... The reason we're going to focus on proteins today is because proteins have the ability to impact or influence various traits within organisms. 
Now, has everybody heard of a trait before? You can also use the word characteristic if you're more comfortable with that. But let's consider different traits that humans can have, or maybe even other organisms. So a lot of times when I ask students to give me examples of traits, some of the first traits that people volunteer tend to be things like hair color or eye color or height. And those are all fabulous examples. You can also consider how traits are influencing how our bodies work. So that can include how we digest foods or even how other molecules interact together within our body. Today, we're going to be talking about a protein that's not a human protein. The protein of our interest today is actually a jellyfish protein. So I'm going to just give you one more slide here. Let me try to draw a jellyfish to the best of my ability. Here's my little jellyfish. Okay. And this species of jellyfish that I'm trying to draw right here is Aquaria victoria, or the Pacific jellyfish. And this jellyfish has an unusual trait. It has the ability to make a protein that it that allows it to glow green. So amazing. Now, do humans have the ability to glow green? What do you guys think? As far as I know, on the outside we don't. Humans do not make this green protein. If we were to study the jellyfish DNA, we would find that within their DNA, there is a gene, like we were just discussing, that codes for that protein. And that protein that I've been referring to is called GFP, which stands for green fluorescent protein. And if a cell makes GFP, the way that we know that that cell is making that protein, well, what do you think? How do we know if a cell is making GFP? That cell will have the ability to glow green if they're making this protein. So what I would like to do with you guys today is I would like to take that jellyfish gene and transfer it into living bacteria cells. If our experiment is a success, how will we know? Well, if we give the bacteria some time to grow and replicate so we can see them, our bacteria cells should have the ability to glow green just like the jellyfish does. What we'll be doing, I want to just show you our bacteria cells, we'll be working with these individual cells, but we're going to have so many of them. So I'll say we'll have hundreds of thousands of bacteria that we're working with. Our goal is to successfully transfer that gene into their cells, so we must consider the bacteria cell itself and how we can work with those. Do you guys love bacteria cells? What do you think? I realize that bacteria cells get kind of a bad reputation. While there are some bacteria out there that can make us sick, the majority of the bacteria in the world are harmless to us. In fact, did you guys know that you have bacteria cells in your body? You have an incredible amount of bacteria cells in your body. Let me draw up here just a general bacteria cell. So I'll draw the outside. Within their cells here, their DNA just kind of floats around in the middle. And these little structures I'm drawing over here, these little dots, these are ribosomes. Can anybody tell me why ribosomes are so important? Ribosomes are where proteins are made in cells. So although I have not drawn much in this bacteria cell, remember, here's their DNA. DNA is a set of instructions to make various proteins, and bacteria cells have those instructions, and they have the machinery necessary to build those proteins. In addition, some bacteria cells have extra DNA, which I'll draw over here. This is a circular piece of DNA, which we call a plasmid. 
mid, and I'll write that right down here for you. Okay. And plasmids, let me shrink that up, exist in some bacteria cells, and what these cells can do with these plasmids is they can clone them, which means they can copy those plasmids. They can even share those plasmids if they want with other bacteria cells. As scientists, we're going to take advantage of these plasmids. We take these plasmids, so let me take this plasmid, and I'll put it on another page for us. Let's see if I can paste it here, if I can figure that out. Does that work? Look at that, great, okay. Let me just make it bigger so we can talk about it. So here's our bacterial plasmid. If you remember, in the beginning of the lesson, I said that scientists have the ability to cut DNA and glue DNA together as well. So what we could do with this plasmid is we could cut a plasmid open, and then we can also add in whatever our gene of interest is. So what? that's not very pretty looking there, but what we could add in in this case is we could glue in our jellyfish gene, our GFP gene. In this experiment, we also have a second gene in our plasmids. So let me just add that in on the right side. So this second gene, I'll just draw it in a different color. In reality, it would not be a different color. I'm just making that so it's easier for us to see. This gene on the other side of the plasmid is for something called ampicillin resistance. That takes me a while to write. Give me a second. Okay. Has anybody ever heard of ampicillin before? Or maybe a medicine that sounds like ampicillin? What do you guys think? Ampicillin, a lot of people realize it sounds very similar to penicillin. And both ampicillin and penicillin are types of antibiotics. Antibiotics are medicines that are used to either kill or inhibit the growth of bacteria cells. So if you guys have ever been sick with bacteria, it's possible that when you went to your doctor, they prescribed you an antibiotic to get rid of that bacteria that was making you sick. In the lab, we can use antibiotics to help us with these experiments. What I have over here, this gene, is not a gene to make that antibiotic. This is a, actually a gene to enable bacteria cells to resist that antibiotic. Tell me what it means if bacteria cells are able to resist an antibiotic. It means that these bacteria cells will not be destroyed or even affected by that antibiotic if they have the ability to resist it. You might be wondering, why would we be making bacteria glow and giving them the ability to resist an antibiotic? Well, let me show you just why this gene is so important for this experiment. Let me draw my little bacteria cells again for you. So there I've got my cell with its DNA and its ribosome. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. Let's give it a little more DNA there. Hold on. Let me put that together. And I'm just going to rotate that a little bit. And let me make lots more of these cells. So in our experiment, we're going to have so many bacteria cells. Our goal is to take these plasmids, remember what we were just discussing? I want to take that plasmid and I want to get it into some of these bacteria cells. I don't have to get it into all of the bacteria cells, but I do want to get it into some. So let me, I'll just draw it in blue. Let's say I successfully transferred the plasmid into this cell right here. If the cells take up that plasmid, they'll have the ability to make GFP, which is great. If they're making GFP, they should also be glowing green. Awesome. The problem here is 
that if I only had the gene for GFP in that plasmid, you see these other cells out here that did not take up the plasmid? We call those untransformed cells. Those untransformed cells, what they would do, if they don't take up the plasmid, they're just going to grow right on top of that transformed cell, the one that did take up the plasmid. And I'm never going to see that cell. So that would be a problem. In order for me to find the bacteria that successfully take up that plasmid, I have to eliminate these other cells somehow. And that's where that second gene comes in. That resistance gene, well, if my bacterial cell with the plasmid also has that antibiotic resistance gene, think about what would happen if I add ampicillin to this environment right now. The ampicillin would inhibit or block the growth of these other cells. So let me just take those off the screen. But the ampicillin would not be able to affect the cell that took up the plasmid. So this resistance gene is so important because it allows us to isolate the cells that we have transformed, that we gave the DNA to. So if you guys are ready, I'd like to start and show you the different steps of the lab. So in front of me, I have a lot of equipment. If you guys have worked with us before, maybe you have used some of this equipment. One of my favorite pieces of equipment in the lab is a pipette. I love using pipettes. These are used for measurement. They're used to measure small volumes, which we call microliters. Okay? And the symbol for microliter looks like this. There are 1,000 microliters in one milliliter. And what I'd like to do right now on my pipette is I'd like to start off by setting my pipette on 250 microliters. I'm going to just adjust the dial. So, like that. I don't know if you guys can see this, but I've set it, it says 0250, which is 250. I'm going to also show you that there are tips that go along with these pipettes. So here, right here, I have a box of tips or bottoms that I can change throughout the experiment and keep everything sterile. Do you guys know what it means if everything is sterile in the lab? Yeah, we're keeping everything clean, we're keeping it free of contamination. And I'll just show you for practice what it looks like when I place one of these tips on. So I've got my pipette. Just going to place it on, and you see how it just attached itself? I can then use the pipette to transfer liquid between tubes, and when I'm done, I'm just going to change that tip and get a new one if I need. All right, so I would also like to label some tubes so that everything is prepared for once we start. We're going to be working with two tubes in the beginning. And if you guys are using our worksheets for this lab, try to take as many notes as you can. I always like to keep a notebook and write down all the volumes and the different reagents or materials that I add to each tube. All right, so for our purposes, we're gonna have a plus tube and a minus tube. And before I even write what I'm going to add to those tubes, I'm actually going to label them right in front of you. So I have two empty tubes here. These are 1.5 milliliter tubes that we use. I'm going to place a plus on one tube. Just like that. Okay. And let me put that, I like to use a rack also to keep everything organized. And then I'll be placing just a simple minus on the other tube. Just like that. Put that one in the rack as well. We'll be transferring 250 microliters of a liquid called calcium chloride. So this is our calcium chloride tube here. This is just a special salt water solution that we use. And remember I said I'd like to keep track of what I'm doing, so I'm gonna add that, I'm um, adding 250 microliters of calcium chloride to that tube. And oh my gosh, I just erased everything I did. Let me start again. 250 microliters. Calcium chloride, 
I guess I'll just write it over here. 250 microliters calcium chloride. All right. And let me show you how I do this with the pipette. So I'm going to open the tip box. And I have my calcium chloride. Just double checking that my pipette is correctly set. Open the calcium chloride. Maybe you guys can see me pipetting. Going to go to the first stop on this pipette. Gently place the, the tip of the pipette into the liquid, and I'm slowly going to draw up. If you guys notice, I'm keeping everything at eye level so that I can see exactly what's happening. I'm going to pick up one of my tubes, place the tip toward the center, and just gently release all that liquid. Keep that tube closed, and when I've added the calcium chloride, I'm now going to place that on ice. All right. Next tube, same thing. Open my calcium chloride, go to the first stop, gently place it in the liquid, and slowly draw up. No air bubbles. Oh, sorry about that. Let me get my minus tube. Great. I'm gonna close that tube and also put it on ice, and I'm gonna change the tip. What I'd like to do now is I'm going to add the bacteria cells that we'll be using. In this lab, we're using a type of E. coli bacteria called MM294. These are harmless bacteria cells, uh, and they're willing to take up the DNA that we're, we want to introduce into them, so they're perfect for this lab. Have you guys heard of E. coli before? There are some strains of E. coli that can be harmful or dangerous, but this is not one of those strains. I want to add it to my board that I'm adding the bacteria as well. So MM294 is going to go in both of these columns. Maybe I'm just going to put a little mark to distinguish them like that. Let me show you the bacteria. So we grow a lot of bacteria in the lab all the time um, here. And if you could take a look at this plate, let's see. I don't know if you can see them, but there is material all struck on this plate. Let me show you an empty plate real quick so you can see the difference. All right, so this one over here is just empty. It has food for bacteria in it. And this one right here has the bacteria struck on top of that food. So they're just growing on top of that food. And my job right now is going to be to sterilely transfer the cells from that Petri dish into the tubes that we just put the calcium chloride into. First of all, I'm going to be using heat. I'm going to be using flame. So since I have long hair, I'm just going to pull my hair back to be safe. Okay. And I'm going to get my burner out. Okay. I always like to keep my desk organized. So moving stuff around is helpful. This is just going to be gas. I'm going to turn the gas on and I'm going to light it with a spark. There you go. Just took a second. All right. All right. Now, I do like to work close to the flame because this area right here is considered a zone of sterility. And what I mean by that is that because of the heat, I don't want to work so close to the flame that I get hurt or that it um, is just too hot in general, but I'm going to work close enough. This right here, can you guys see this? This is what we call an inoculating loop. And what I'm going to do, here's our inoculating loop. Can you see a little better against my shirt there? Okay. The inoculating loop is literally just a piece of metal, and I'll draw just very simple on the board like this, which has this circle, and I use it as a method of just scraping up or lifting the bacteria cells. So first, what I want to do is I want to sterilize this loop because it's been sitting in the lab and it's just not clean. So first I'm going to place it in the flame, and when it's orange like that, it should be clean. It's also super hot when it's orange. So if I take this flaming hot piece of metal and I pick up living bacteria cells, what do you guys think might happen to them? I bet that if I touched them with this really hot piece of metal, those bacteria cells are going to die. So I would like to, before I take the bacteria up, I'm going to take this loop and just press it 
into the gel in the Petri dish to cool it off. The loop should still be sterile when I do that. You'll notice that I'm holding the plate, doing my best to try to keep anything from contaminating the plate, and I'm just scraping and lifting in a small direction with this loop. I'm trying to get the bacteria off the dish, just like that. Let's see if you guys can see that. I'll hold it up against my shirt. I don't know if you can see that. Maybe I'll get a darker piece of paper to show you guys. Maybe if I hold it against this, you guys can see. You guys see that? Yeah, it's a little bit kind of like a clump of beige or white right there. Yep, those are the bacteria cells. It may not look like a lot, but really there are so many cells in that clump. So I'm gonna open one of my tubes. Either one is fine. And I'm gonna take that and just place it right into the calcium chloride. I'm swirling the bacteria off the loop. They're kind of sticking, so this part can be a little bit frustrating. There we go. Okay, and if you take a look at that, I think I liked using this so you could see it. The, um, the liquid is now cloudy. And that's an indication to me that there are a lot of bacteria cells in there. If you're able to see that though, it does look like there are a whole bunch of clumps of bacteria, which we'll take care of in a second. Let me repeat that for the next tube. So remember, I want to sterilize my loop. Nice and clean. I'm going to cool that loop off so I don't kill the bacteria cells. Right into the gel. Perfect. And now I'm going to try to scrape and lift the bacteria off the dish. Great. Let me pick up my other tube. Open that up, holding everything to eye level. Yeah, they're being a little sticky today. They're sticking to the loop, so I have to work a little bit harder to get them off. Almost there. Excellent. Close that tube, put it in the ice, and I'm just going to clean the, the loop one more time. You guys may have noticed that I've been keeping the cells in ice, and I'm going to explain that to you in a minute. For this portion of the lab, I like the cells to be nice and cold. Okay, we're done with our flame, so I'm just going to move that aside. Okay. And if you remember, I said that there were some clumps of bacteria in here, and I'd like to take care of those. So we can use the pipette to just mix up the cells. I call this resuspending the cells. So I'll take a new tip. I'll take either of my tubes. I can start with either one. And before I go on the liquid, I'll go to the first stop. And I'm simply going to draw up that liquid. Oh, and the clumps are getting stuck. And release. Keep doing that. And this may take a few times, but that's perfectly fine. There we go. That looks great. I'm going to do the same thing for the other two. Just drawing up and releasing. If I have any bacteria on the side, I can use it, use the pipette to just kind of spray that bacteria down or wash it back into solution. All right. Now, at this point, what I'd like to do is I would like to add our plasmid DNA. We're going to add the plasmid to our plus tube only. And that's really what the plus indicates to me. The plus is plus plasmid. The minus is the minus plasmid. Remember with, oh my gosh, I'm going to erase my whole board here. Let's try that again. There we go. Okay. Oh, it doesn't want to group. Here we go. I'm adding 10 microliters of the plasmid that contains the GFPG. So although I didn't write it before on that plasmid, just quick show you, go back a couple of slides here. This plasmid's name is PGFP. So plasmids have names. So the lowercase p stands for plasmid, and the GFP is an indication of that gene of interest right here. So we'll come back. Perfect. All right, so since I'm using only 10 microliters, 
the blue pipette would not be appropriate. The blue pipette only measures from 100 to 1,000 microliters. This yellow pipette, which I'm not using now, but we will use at the end, measures from 10 to 100 microliters. And this gray one here, this is the one that measures from 0.5 to 10 microliters. So I'll be using the gray one for introducing the plasmid DNA into the plus tube. The gray pipette has its own tips, and you'll see just how small they are in comparison. Let me get my plasmid. I have the plasmid in this green tube here. So the plasmid that we're working with is in a concentration of 0 0.008 micrograms per microliter, which I'll add to the board so you have for your notes. That just has to do with the concentration of the DNA. Um, it's telling me essentially how much DNA is in that liquid. If you look at the bottom of the tube, everybody, whenever I give these tubes out to my students, they always say, Aaron, there's nothing in my tube. But I, I don't know if you can take a look. There's a little baby bit of liquid at the bottom, almost the size of a teardrop. It's going to be plenty for this experiment. So let me use my pipette. Oh, my pipette is only set on five. So let me bring it up to 10. All right. I'm going to draw up, and using my eyes, I want to see the liquid going up through the tip. I want to know for sure that I'm taking that liquid up, and there was plenty in there. Let me get my plus two. Okay. When I add the plasmid, I don't want to add it to the top of the tube. I want it to go directly into that cell mixture, and then I release. Right back in the ice. And because we have been working for a little bit, my ice is getting a little bit melty, but that's perfectly fine. I'm going to go into why the ice is so important and how we'll be changing temperature and why just now. So right now, I want to draw what's in our plus two. I'm drawing my bacteria cells here with some openings in that membrane. At a certain point in their development, these bacteria cells can have these openings, which we call adhesion zones, or zones of adhesion. And there's my bacteria cell. Let me make some more cells. We're going to use those adhesion zones to our advantage. All right. So here we've got a whole bunch of bacteria. If this were the plus two, remember, what did we just add to the plus two? We just added the plasmid DNA to the plus tube. So I'm going to just draw some plasmids. I'll just make them blue. So we've got a whole bunch of plasmids in there. Now in my drawing, I have the plasmids on the outside of the cells. If we want these cells to use this DNA and to make these proteins, where do you think we want these plasmids to be? If you said we want them to go in the cells, you're absolutely right. We want a method of pushing the plasmids into those cells. There are a few considerations we have to make here, though. So first, let's think about the DNA molecule itself. So DNA does carry a charge on it. And I'll look right here at my molecule. Okay. So we talked a little bit about the DNA, but let me just untwist it here. Okay. So I love that this model has different colors on it. Um, we've got the white and the black on the side, and that's our sugar phosphate backbone, and we've got our nitrogenous bases in the center. So this is really the code of DNA is in the center. These are our A's, T's, C's, and G's. Well, when we were discussing the charge that's on the DNA, I'm interested in these phosphate groups out here. The phosphate groups on the DNA molecule have a negative charge. So when we're working with DNA, we want to remember that DNA carries that negative charge. If we're trying to push the DNA, or a negatively charged molecule, into a cell, let's consider that membrane as well. So the membrane has a negative charge just like the DNA molecule. And that has to do with the phospholipids in there. The DNA has a negative charge, and the membrane has a negative charge. Does anybody know why that might be a problem for us if we're interested in pushing the DNA into the cells? Well, 
what would happen to the DNA is that the DNA would be repelled or pushed back because of those two negative charges. So what do we need to add to this environment? We need some positives. The reason that we use the calcium chloride is to neutralize this environment. So let's draw some positives up here. Once everything is neutralized, I then still need a method of pushing the DNA into the cell. And it's amazing. We can use heat to push DNA into these cells. Heat creates movement of molecules. So remember that our cells are nice and cold right now? I bet not much is moving around in there because everything is cold. But think about it. If we take these tubes, which are cold now, and we warm them up, we should get some movement of those molecules. And that includes the DNA. I'd like to show you an animation that does a beautiful job of this next step for us. Let's see if I can pull that up. Maybe not. Um, where did I have it? Here it is. Perfect. Okay. So this step is called the heat shock. Here's a beautiful picture of bacteria cells. They did a much better job of drawing the bacteria than I did. And you see those nice adhesion zones right there. What we'll do is we'll zoom in on one of those adhesion zones. Perfect. So this area in the center is that opening that I was trying to draw. And then we have those phospholipids, which are bouncing around all over the place in the membrane. You can see that they have their negative charge as well. If at this point we tried to add a plasmid to this cell, what I predict would happen is because the membrane is negatively charged and the plasmid is negatively charged, I predict that that plasmid would get bounced out. And that's what we're going to show you right here. Oh, did you see that plasmid come in and then get pushed right out like that? So in order for this to work for us, we're going to take a few steps here. We're using the calcium chloride, and we're going to put them on ice. So by putting the cells on ice while they're in calcium chloride, watch what happens. Everything slows down, and everything is now ready for us to transfer that DNA into the cell. If you remember, all we need is a little bit of heat at this point. There have been a number of experiments that have identified that the best temperature for transferring the DNA in is 42 degrees Celsius. So watch what happens. When you raise the temperature at this point to 42 degrees Celsius, we expect that the DNA would get pushed right in. In order to encourage that DNA now to stay in that cell, I would want everything to slow down so I'll place everything back on ice. I'll draw these steps out for you, just so it's nice and clear. And again, if you're taking notes in the lab, you could write this down. So here's our heat shock. And it's a set of three temperature stages. So the first one we're doing right now, we're doing the ice. Anybody know what the temperature of ice is in degrees Celsius? zero degrees Celsius. So I like to do that step for about 15 minutes. And we're doing that right now. So I'm going to just put a little check mark next to that. In the next step, I want to bring the temperature up to 42 degrees Celsius. And I realized that we work in Celsius in the lab. So if you're more comfortable with Fahrenheit, this is approximately 108 degrees Fahrenheit. A lot of people think that's a very high temperature. Um, I suspect that, well, think about your body temperature. Uh, body temperature, an average temperature would be about 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. So this is just a little bit warmer than our body temperature. You would never want to have a fever that high, but I bet you've taken a shower or a bath that is about that temperature. We like to do this temperature for 90 seconds. Once we do that step, I hope that some plasmids have been transferred into the cell. And again, to encourage them to stay in there, I'm going to place them on ice. I'd like to do that for at least one minute. So you can do that longer, but we definitely want to do it for at least a minute. So let me show you how simple the heat shock is. 
I have a water bath over here, which is set to 42 degrees Celsius, nice and warm. And I always make my heat shock distinct. So my tubes are either in the ice or they're in this water bath and they're nowhere else. So if I were about to start my heat shock, I would get my timer set. I'm gonna take both tubes out because both need to do this step. And I place them right here in this rack in that water. And after 90 seconds, so we can pretend that 90 seconds went by, I'm gonna take those tubes and I have my beaker right next to me. I'm gonna place them right back in my ice. And again, it's okay. My tube, my ice is getting a little watery, no problem. I'm gonna leave those in there. So what I expect has happened is that the plasmids have moved into some of those cells. One more step I'd like to take is I would like to give the bacteria cells some liquid food. So I'll be using my blue pipette again. It happens to be on 250 microliters. So let me add that. Let me go back to our little slide here. Perfect. I'm gonna just add this step because I don't want to forget. I'm gonna add 250 microliters of what we call LB, which is the bacterial liquid food. And that's gonna go on both the tubes. I really, so if you're looking at this chart, it displays nicely that the only difference here is this, okay? Is that we added the DNA to the plus tube and not to the minus tube. All right, so let's add our LB. All right, I'll just check, I'm still on 250. Get my LB out over here. I'm gonna draw that up. Get either tube, I can start with either one, it doesn't matter. I'm gonna add that to the tube. Change my tip. Get a new one. Another 250 from the LB. At this point, I can discard this. Just add it to my next two. Great. All right, so I'd like to know if everything worked. So in order to do that, I have to take those bacteria cells from the tubes and grow them on Petri dishes. I'm going to show you the, the Petri dishes that I have here. I've already labeled them. Okay, so they look just like this. And all I do is I just take a Sharpie marker and I write on the bottom of the dish the information that I need. I'm just going to display on the board for you because I know it may not be clear when you're looking at my dishes like that, the information that I have. We have it somewhere down here. Okay, so I have four Petri dishes for this lab. Um, let's see if I can highlight this. So over here, this is just a little key over here. Uh, so that single line, it represents a Petri dish that just has LB or food in it. That double line right there is a Petri dish that has ampicillin in it as well. So I am using two different types of Petri dishes in this lab. So you'll see up here, these right here are my two LB plates, and these down here are my two ampicillin plates. And also remember that we have two different tubes as well. We have plus tubes and we have minus tubes. So it can get a little confusing and I always like to keep good notes on how I label my plates. I am going to take the plus bacteria, so bacteria from the plus tube, and I'll be adding it to any plate, let me just make this a little more clear, so there's a plus, that has a plus on it, this is also a plus. And my minus bacteria, I'll just draw it in green, maybe that's a little easier, okay? I'm gonna add the minus bacteria to any plate that has a minus, so if you can imagine, Let's say this is my minus tube, this is my plus tube. What I'll do in a second, you'll watch me, is I'm just going to take 100 microliters from these tubes and plate it onto each of those plates. Oh, that's not very neat. I apologize for my handwriting. All right. If I were just to add the bacteria to the center of the plate, they would just be sitting in this little puddle, which would not be very useful for us. There are different methods of spreading bacteria, so I'll show you the one that we happen to like to use in this lab. So I'm going to take over here. I have these tubes, which have little sterile glass beads in there. Can you hear that? This is little beads in there. What I'm gonna do is put one of these tubes on each of these plates. So I'm just going to open the tube, 
do my best just to dump the beads on there. What often happens when I do this is that some of the beads bounce out and land on the table or even the floor. Do you think it would be a good idea? Let's say I dump the beads out and they fell on the table. Do you think it would be a good idea for me to pick those beads up and throw them back into the Petri dish? I definitely would not want to do that. I would not want to do that because the beads, once they're on the table, they wouldn't be sterile. And if I place them into the dish, they could contaminate the experiment. So I would always just get a new tube of beads if that were the case. All right, so I'm ready to plate my bacteria. If you remember, I said I was going to plate 100 microliters. So yellow pipette is what I'm using for this. This happens, I don't know if you guys can see this, but this is what 100 looks like. On the gray and the yellow pipettes, we have lines that represent decimal points. So this is 100 microliters. All right, I like to get organized. So among my Petri dishes, remember I have all my labels going. I'm just going to separate, yep, these are my plus dishes and these are my minus dishes. So I'll take my plus tube, let me open this up. I'm going to take out 100. And I'm just going to lift the plate up a little bit and release the liquid onto that plate. We're doing exactly the same thing from the same tube for the second plus plate. And then I'll discard that and change my tip. Same thing for the minus, taking out 100. Taking out another 100. All right. I take all of my plates and just stack them together. If you were working with a partner and you wanted to share the work, you could both take a stack, and I want you to shake them at this point. So that clinking sound that you hear is the beads moving around as I shake the plates. And what the beads are doing is as they roll across the surface of the plate, they're pushing and moving the bacteria evenly across the surface. I like to do that usually for about a minute to make sure everything is evenly spread. And once I've done that, I do remove the beads. I remove them very simply by tapping the bottom, holding both sides of the dish, and just opening and knocking them out. Usually you can tell if they're still in there because they're knocking around. All right. At this point, I would take my Petri dishes and I would flip them so they're upside down and I would place them, let's pretend I'm placing them in an incubator overnight at 37 degrees Celsius. When I come in in the morning, I should see, if everything has worked, I should see some bacterial growth. If you don't have an incubator, which many of us don't, you can leave the dishes out at room temperature. They just take a little bit longer to grow because they're usually at a colder temperature when um, they're at room temperature. I'd like to show you just what it looks like or what the expected results are on the board, and then I'll show you one of our real plates. Okay, so let's consider this. If a Petri dish just has food, so just has LB, so this one right here is the one I'm talking about, Okay. And I add bacteria from the minus tube. So I'm just adding regular bacteria and calcium chloride to a plate with food. What would you expect to have bacteria cells? Oh, it didn't like that. Let's try it again. Oh, we'll do it this way. The bacteria cells will grow all over the plate. That pattern of growth where you just have the bacteria everywhere, that is considered a lawn. So let's say I take those same cells. Is anyone let me copy them? No, oh, okay. I'll take those same cells and I'm gonna add them to this plate right here. Oh, I didn't want to do that. I'm gonna add them to this plate right here, this one. Those are regular bacteria cells and I'm adding them to a Petri dish that has the antibiotic ampicillin on it. What do you think is gonna happen if that's the case? So you're introducing bacteria into an antibiotic their growth is going to be inhibited, so I would expect there to be no growth on this plate. That is an important plate for us. 
That is telling us that our bacteria cells are inhibited by the ampicillin, and it's also telling us that our ampicillin is working in the lab. Now let's consider our plus plates. If our experiment is a success, remember, we should have been able to get some of those plasmids into some of the cells in the plus tube. I don't expect that all the cells in the plus tube took up the plasmid, but that's fine. If those cells took up the plasmid, I would expect them to have the ability to glow green. So there should be some glowing bacteria on that dish. But keep in mind that the bacteria cells in that plate, they, I'm sorry, in that tube, all of them did not take up the plasmid. So we would end up with, let me try this one more time, bacteria cells, there we go, that don't take up the plasmid and grow on top of our glowy cells. So although these two petri dishes, right, oh no, oh, boom, wait, everything is bouncing around here. Although these two petri dishes right here, these two right here, will look the same to us, they are genetically different. Now let's take a look at this plate right here. So this is a plate where I'm adding the same cells from the plus two. I should get glowing cells on there if everything has worked. And I am adding to this plate, remember, I am adding still those cells that did not take up the plasma. But think about this. This right here, this, pe oh, it keeps doing that. This Petri dish, okay, this one right here, it has the antibiotic ampicillin in it. And we said that that ampicillin is going to inhibit the growth of any bacteria that don't have that plasmid. So we're gonna get rid of those. The only cells that we're hopefully gonna be able to see on this plate are gonna be the glowing cells. I'd like to show you, because our plates aren't ready yet because we just did this, I'd like to show you a Petri dish that I have from already doing this experiment. The bacteria cells that glow green, they do have a green color to them, but when we put them under a UV light, the GFP protein grows, I'm sorry, glows super bright. So if we can, I'll see if my friends can help me here, we can kind of turn down the lights, I'll put a black light on, and you can see. Can you guys still see me here? Am I right in the camera? Is that too much? What do you think? So here we go. Look at that. Oh, they're so beautiful. Oh my gosh. Can you guys see this? I think over there. Yeah. Here are glowing bacteria cells. Okay. And we can see that they have that jellyfish protein. They're making that jellyfish protein. This plate that I have in front of you guys is, it has a lot of bacteria cells on it. I'm going to show you one that just has less. It's still an absolutely beautiful plate. And before we finish up, I just want to explain to you, I'm not going to hold up this one, which has fewer cells here, okay? You can see that they're in these little dots. Do you guys see that? So those individual dots, we call those colonies. So each of these little colonies here, that is the result of a successfully, single successfully transformed cell. So that cell took up the plasmid, survived on the plate, and reproduced or replicated, and now we have a whole clump of bacteria in that region. So each of those little colonies should have clones of bacteria all around it. So I hope that you guys had a good time today. Um, if possible, I'll see if I can maybe answer some questions. And I wanted to let you know that we do have worksheets available for you on our website, and that we'll be continuing to do a variety of different experiments with you guys. So hopefully you can check back every day, and if you're available, you can keep working with us. Let's see. Well, I just want to say thank you to everybody for all your hard work and for giving me your attention. I'm so grateful, um, and I hope everybody has a wonderful day. Oh.